I work for Public Health England as the um, programme manager for the Fetal Anomaly Screening Programme. And as part of that programme, we have a pathway for screening and offering screenings to women for Downs, Edwards and Patau syndromes. Uh, there's been quite a lot of scrutiny um, professionally in the media around whether or not we should use NIPT as part of the current pathway. Um, and we are now moving towards an evaluative implementation of that. So I'm going to go through that a little bit. I know it's a very diverse group, so I will try and just cover some issues around how screening works in, in England and uh, in the UK as well as we go through. So there is a body called the UK National Screening Committee, and they are an independent committee uh, who provide, who look at evidence around uh, conditions that um, should or should not be screened for in the UK, and they then make recommendation to the ministers in the four countries. Um, if the minister in England, because I, as a member of the Fetal Anomaly Screening Programme, have a remit for implementation in England only, the other countries will have their own systems, but if the minister decides to accept that recommendation, it will then come through to Public Health England and to the appropriate screening programme for implementation, so we would put that into operation. And we do that in conjunction and collaboration with NHS England. So Public Health England is a body that's responsible for setting um, standards, for ensuring there's appropriate education and training for those NHS professionals who will need to offer the screening. Um, and NHS England are the people who would commission. And they commission the screening to the specification that's written by us based on the, on, on the evidence. So that's how, in a very quick nutshell, that all works. And the UK NSC... Um, undertook a, a, a review of the evidence for using NIPT in screening for Downs, Edwards and Patau syndromes in 2015 and um, the minister recommended that we should undertake an evaluative rollout of that um, in 2016. The recommendation was made and we're now working towards putting that into operation and we hope we'll be in a position to start offering that um, screening in 2018. Um, it's an evaluative rollout so what that means is this is not coming in as our normal business as usual. So we will not be writing it directly into the specification we give to the NHS to commission this. It will be done alongside our current uh, specification so that we are able to uh, answer some of the questions the UK NSC have posed as part of the evaluation and make any necessary changes to our pathway as we move along that process. It will also be an additional option for those women who have a higher chance, that's a, one in, a, a chance of 1 in 2 to 1 in 150 um, on our current pathway. Because what the UK NSC said is they, we need to implement this with minimal impact on our current pathway. So that the current offer to women um, de is dependent on the gestation and pregnancy at booking. So if they book before 14 weeks and one day, they can be offered the combined test. This is a test whereby we, we um, take a blood test, but we also take some ultrasound scan measurements. Um, the crown rump length, which is basically the length of the baby from the top of the head to the, the bottom, and the nuchal translucency, which is some fluid which is at the back of the baby's neck. So that, the, the mother's age and the um, biochemical markers from the blood sample are all included in an identification of a risk or a chance, and the woman will get a numerical result of one in two to one, well, it could be one in two to one in anything, but for us, a higher chance result is one in two to one in 150. At that point, she would be offered either the chance to, to say, well, that's a chance and you know, we'll just see how the rest of the pregnancy progresses, or they can choose to have an invasive test, which would be an amniocentesis or a chorionic villus sampling, which to get a definitive diagnosis using, as Joanne explained this morning, karyotyping. But, um, that does carry a chance of miscarriage, so some women are reluctant to go down that pathway. What we are going to be doing now is we will be um, offering women the opportunity to, at that point where we offer um, invasive prenatal diagnosis by amnio or CVS or nothing, we will get a third option, which is NIPT. Okay? Now, the UK NSC have asked us to answer specifically these questions. What do women choose to do Right from the start of the programme, if we have NIPT as an option at that point, do we see more women entering the pathway than we do at the moment? Okay. What do women do when they're offered those three choices? And what are the factors that may affect that choice? Okay. And then further down the pathway, if you get a definitive diagnosis, 
or a higher chance on NIPT, what are women's choices at that point? So there's a range of things that we're looking at across the pathway in terms of what do women choose to do with the information that they get from this screening test. We want also to look at the accuracy for screening for T18 and T30, that's Edwards and Patau syndromes, because it seems that it's not as accurate for those two conditions as it is for Down syndrome. There's quite a lot of concern about how often we'll get a no result um, a test failure rate, and the literature and the evidence is very diverse on this. Um, it can be a little bit dependent on the technology that's used as well. Um, but it ranges, it ranges anywhere from about 2 to 15 percent. And so what we want to know is how often does that happen, uh, that a woman ac accepts the NIPT and then gets no result, because that clearly will have an impact on the pathway and on how quickly the woman gets some information about what to do next. And also we want to know how long it takes the woman to get the result back, because by doing this we will obviously introduce a secondary step in the pathway and there will be some degree of delay before you get to a definitive answer. Okay, so that's just um, <coughs> our pathway. That's a tiny exit of our pathway. It's a very complicated program. <laughs> so, but essentially what we're trying to show there is, in the middle, the three choices of um, uh, NIPT, uh, no further testing, or invasive prenatal diagnosis, IPD. Uh, and under the, the other two, if you, if you choose invasive prenatal diagnosis, the pathway will continue as it currently does, or no further test. But for NIPT, uh, you will either get a result, uh, you'll get e one of three options on your result. You'll either get a higher chance result, a lower chance result, or a no result. If you get a no result, we will offer the test one further time. Okay? But after the second time, if there's no result, then you would move into the um, CVS amniocentesis offer and follow that pathway down. So what is it? Exactly, and I'm glad I've got a, such a geneticist in the room because I'm a midwife, so I, <laughs> I know very superficially what this is, this is about. So essentially what we'll be doing is, is taking a blood sample from the pregnant woman to analyse the total cell-free DNA. And the NIPT assesses whether the woman has a higher chance of having a baby with Downs, Edwards or Patau syndromes. And we are just looking at those three conditions. Because of recent innovations in the technologies, we can now identify and quantify the changes in the amount of cell-free fetal DNA that circulates in the mother's blood. So during the pregnancy, it's the placenta that sheds baby's DNA into the mother's bloodstream. So this is coming from the placenta, not directly from the fetus. Okay, and it will contain, therefore, a mixture of the mother's and the baby's DNA. <clears throat> By measuring that, we can predict whether there's a higher chance or a lower chance of the baby having one of those three conditions. And it remains in the circulation only for a few hours after e in each pregnancy. So once the baby's born, this will be there for a few hours and then it disappears. So it's particularly suitable for pregnancy-specific testing. And there are a number of adv advantages for us using the NIPT test as part of the pathway. It does have high detection rates and low screen positive rates. It is a more accurate test than the current combined test. But what the evidence showed in the Warwick review was that actually it works better in populations of women who are already identified as higher risk than in a general pregnant population. So we talk about something in screening called positive predictive value. And the positive predictive value um, in the literature would suggest that in a, in, a, in a population of women who are already identified as higher risk, it's around about the uh, high 90, 97, 98%. But if you do it in a general population of pregnant women, it's only down to around 50%. Okay. Bear in mind that we, the current positive predictive value of the combined test is about 13%, so we're, <laughs> we're already doing better than that. But it does have a higher detection rate and low screen positive rates. Uh, it will reduce the requirement for diagnostic testing, and because we'll see lower invasive, fewer invasive diagnostic procedures, we're exposing less women to the harm, potential harm, of miscarriage following one of those um, <coughs> procedures. It will give women more information, um, particularly those women who would not, who would have had no further testing. So you have a combined test, you're told you're higher chance, you don't want to take the potential risk of a miscarriage, and so you 
you do nothing else. So of course there is the general clinical examination and, and pregnancy monitoring, but there is no further information that you can get. So you're just sort of waiting to see what happens at the birth. So those women would have an opportunity to have further information. And there will be benefits to the NHS in terms of the cost effectiveness of the test, particularly if we reduce, if we are introducing it as we are at the moment, at the, part of the initial part of the evaluation, which is in the higher risk population. Because you will see a, a benefit of less invasive tests, which are expensive both in terms of the, the potential for the woman, harm to the woman, but also in terms of cost, even though NIPT is expensive. But there are some real considerations that we need people to be aware of, and we need certainly midwives and health professionals who are offering the screening to ensure that women understand before they accept the offer of screening. It is not just a simple blood test, and that's one of the things that certainly some of the stakeholder groups are very concerned about in terms of how we present this to women. Um, that it's, If it's just a blood test, I'll have it done, without really considering some of the uh, decisions you might need to make further down the line. It needs to be a definite screening decision uh, because of that. So because this is, it's, it, if, you, if you decide to take the blood test, you still potentially will have to make a decision at some point further down the pathway about whether or not you wish to accept an invasive test or not. Um, and so women really need to understand that. And they need to understand that right at the beginning of the pathway before they enter the combined screening or the quadruple screening. They need to understand that they might not get a result. So you might decide to take this. You do have a, a slight delay in the pathway. I come around a bit so you can see me, sorry. Um, and then you get a no result. And it's what do I do at this point? Do I opt for a further screen using an IPT, potentially wait another week for a result, and then get a further no result? Can be a difficult decision to make. And the, all these are, are happening at a point where there's quite a a lot of going on in the pregnancy, and these are very gestationally specific um, tests. And of course, if you do decide to go down the definitive NI, uh, IPD re result and you get a result of an affected pregnancy, then you have a decision to make at that point about what you do next. And so pregnancy is progressing, and you're getting further and further into the pregnancy as you're having to make these decisions. It can be quite difficult for women. So it will delay the screening time frame. Uh, so that's the sort of practicalities of some of the issues that we've been trying to deal with and think about and particularly important in terms of how we've structured the education and training for the health professionals who are going to be offering this test, how we're structuring the information for the public. Um, and we've been working very closely uh, in doing that with stakeholders, uh, Down Syndrome Association, um, Down Syndrome Research Foundation, a group called Antenatal Results and Choices, and also a group called SOFT, the support of families with trisomy 18 and 13, so that we're able to get clear information to women around what the conditions mean, what, what it's like to live with a condition as a parent or as an individual at, in 2017, because a lot of the, data, the information we've had up till now is quite, quite old. So we've been doing quite a bit of filming with families and, and talking to families, but also then talking to women and trying to prevent, uh, present the stories of women who've made a different choice to end the pregnancy with an affected result. Um, and so, so that's what's happening at the moment. So we are now at the moment in the midst of rolling out an education training programme for maternity providers to ensure that uh, all those who offer this screening for women understand how this works, what the process is, and what sort of information women will, women will be requiring to hear so they can make a, an informed, personalised decision about whether or not they wish to enter the pathway. Um, so in the laboratory, and I was very grateful that Joanne was speaking this morning so I can skip through some of the <laughs> this, but essentially this is the laboratory workflow for an NIPT test, um, which follows exactly what um, Joanne was talking about this morning, and the turnaround time we're aiming for is five to seven days, which I think uh, is um, reasonably challenging. Um, we will only be setting the analysis pipeline to look at 18, 13 and 21, nothing else. Okay, so um, she talked about uh, the sequencing methodology. So this is the uh, massive, massively parallel sequencing she was talking about. So you've got the um, cell-free maternal DNA, cell-free DNA there. And then it uh, is um, sequenced and then aligned and counted. So you can see whether or not you have 
more genetic material than you would expect on any of these three chromosomes. So that's a very si a simplified version of what it has. And so you can see that on the left, you have um, what you would expect, and on the right, you have some additional material for T20, uh, chromosome 21, which would be Down syndrome. Um, but there are also some slightly different things. So um, a couple of methodologies, DANSA, which is a variation to MPSS, um, which um, decreases the load from about 25 million fragments to about a million, and the targeted um, sequencing of single nucleotide polymorphisms as well. So we are not essentially dictating what type of methodology is used. Um, we will evaluate what uh, is commissioned via NHS England. Um, all, all of the technologies that can bid, though, to produce, to, to actually deliver this, have to have been considered as part of the Warwick review that was undertaken by the UK NSC and be, be, have been commercially available at that time. And of course, as you know, technologies evolve. And so what happens in terms of any changes to the pathways or to the programmes for the UK NSC is there is a regular cycle of review they have about 300 conditions that they review on a, probably something like a three-yearly basis, including those programs that already exist. So that would be true for Down's Edwards and Patau syndromes. But if anything significant occurs within that three-year period, you can do something called a program modification process. So people can present their evidence, and the UK NSC will look at that and decide whether or not there needs to be a change recommendation to the minister. Um, and if the minister recommends the change, it comes to us to, change, to implement the change. The, so that would be true of, of, of evidence around the conditions, but it would also be true of evidence around the technologies that are used to screen for the conditions. Okay. So we will report as either higher chance or lower chance. We're not going to be putting a numerical value on the reports for NIPT but we will reflect the wording that we're using for the combined and quad test at the moment, higher chance or lower chance. Now, dependent on their screening choices, they can have up to two results reported. Um, one for Down syndrome and one for edwards Patau's, and we will issue that as a combined result, as we do in combined, and quadruple, uh, combined testing. They can choose to have Down syndrome only, or they can choose just to have Edwards and Patau syndrome only. And dependent on those choices, the pipeline will be assessed, so they will only report against the, 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 um, the test that the woman has um, accepted. And very simply, lower chance means it's unlikely, and it is unlikely the baby has Downs, Edwards and Patau, and higher chance means there is a chance the baby's affected, and we would then go on to discuss what the options were for that woman. And those options are to say, thank you very much, but I'd like no further testing, or I really need to know definitively whether the baby is affected or not, in which case we'll be discussing invasive prenatal diagnosis. We will not be reporting fetal sex, and there will be no incidental findings reported. Okay. Now, no result means that the lab hasn't been able to give it a definitive result, and we can't say whether there's a chance the baby has the condition or not. Most likely, this will be due to there not being enough cell-free fetal DNA present in the blood sample, but it could be a technical laboratory issue or a sampling issue. And we'll be looking at the reasons for no result, as well as the rates of no result as part of the evaluation. Um, we will offer a second test because CFF DNA does increase with gestation but we have to be clear to the woman, there is a chance it will not give a result. Now, NIPT is still screening. It's not diagnostic. Okay, the fetal DNA might, in some pregnancies, be different to the DNA in the placenta. If you remember, I said that this is actually percent, DNA is shed from the placenta, not from the fetus. And sometimes you can see a line in the, in the placenta which doesn't appear in the fetus. So because of that, there is a chance of a false positive or a false negative result. And we do have results that have been published that don't reflect the fetal carrier type. Um, the most common reason is something called confined placental mosaicism. 
and that's where you find a line within the of, of cells within the placenta which show the trisomy. Okay, but it isn't in the in the fetus. It can be due to maternal chromosome anomaly that is not known. Uh, it could be a maternal malignancy. Most commonly, you would identify that through a false positive result. The baby's born, is not affected, and then you're looking for potential reasons why. Um, or it could be due to a vanished or demised twin. So the pregnancy started as a twin pregnancy. One of the twins is demised, and, but is still shedding DNA at the time that you actually undertake the test. For that reason, if we have any evidence of vanished or demised twin, they won't be eligible for the offer of an NIPT screen. The most common reason for false positive is, is the confined placental mosaicism. And that causes us a problem because this is quite a test. It's likely for most women to be quite early in pregnancy. If you get a confined placental mosaicism through the NIPT, um, and so you get a higher chance result, the woman is then offered invasive prenatal diagnosis. Most commonly, they will be within the time frame for the offer of a chorionic villus sampling test, which is also placental tissue. Um, so there is a chance that you might also see a higher chance, uh, a, a, a diagnosis of something like the 47XX plus 21, okay, on the rapid test. But actually, if you wait for the full karyotype, the, the long-term culture, it's a normal female result. So we will be needing to ensure that women understand that and that any, we're not saying women shouldn't have a CVS, but what we're saying is they need to be aware of that risk and they also then need to wait for the full karyotype result before making any decisions about what to do in terms of the pr pregnancy progressing or not, depending on their choice. You won't see that problem if it's an amniocentesis. Okay. So that's a sort of, in a nutshell, of where we are with NIPT, but I thought I'd just give you an idea of what we're trying to predict in terms of activity very briefly. So the current position for us is, is we have something called the Down Syndrome Quality Assurance Support Service, and that actually monitors and assesses information from the biochemistry labs and provides information back to them to try and improve the screening program. And so the cycles we're looking at there are cycles of DQAT, and they, every six months we start a new cycle. So you can see in 2017 we had roughly um, 500,000 um, samples undertaken for biochemical screening, either combined or quad testing, in England. And that's the proportion, and that's pretty static, that's what we see, around about 85% combined to 15% quadruple tests. So overwhelmingly, the number of women having combined testing. And this here, it shows you, um, in that little bar, all those little grey dots are women who's had screening. <laughs> And the red dots are where the affected pregnancies are. Okay. So you can see that overwhelmingly, they're in that little group there, so they're in the higher chance bracket. And what we see in 2017 was around about 13,500 higher chance results using a chance at term of one in 150. And so on that little pictogram there, you've got all the grey dots, uh, which are higher chance results and the red dots who are affected pregnancies. And you can see the vast majority of the affected pregnancies are at the high end of the, of the higher chance group. So one in two to one in, one, one in five. What we see at the moment is these two choices. So the line across, you get the group of women who choose IPD and those who decide to do nothing further. Um, Interestingly, the vast majority of women who have a higher chance result, more of those women take IPD than not. And in, it's not necessarily because they intuitively know there's something wrong. It's because what we see in the behaviour choice is that if you have a very high chance result, you tend to take invasive prenatal diagnosis. But in the new world, we'll see NIPT in the middle. So we will see a drop in the number of women taking IPD at that point and taking an IPT instead. But Certainly, the biggest significant difference is going to probably be in the women who, at the moment, would take no further testing. And you'll see a significant number of those women who would, we predict, opt for NIPT. So this is the current choice. Now, what we've done here is we've used the DQAS data, and we're uh, using a maternal age reference um, range, and we've applied the behavioral choices that were seen in the RAPID study. So you can see 
what women would choose to do. And you can see that actually for those women who were affected by Downs, Edwards and Patels, the vast majority of those women opted for uh, an invasive prenatal diagnostic test. In the unaffected population, it was almost half and half. But in the new pathway with the option of NIPT, um, you'll still see a significant number of those women who, who have affected pregnancies opting for IPD. But there are a significant decrease in the number of women doing nothing or opting for no further testing. So we see in the current format about 53% of those women who have an unaffected pregnancy opting for invasive prenatal diagnosis. But with NIPT, we're probably going to see that reduced to just over 30%. So there will be a reduction in those women who are being exposed to the risk of miscarriage at that point. And you can see a significant difference in the women who do nothing. So having further information on which to base the decisions going forward on their pregnancy. So if they are undertaking IPT and getting a lower chance result um, and making decisions based on that. Or if they are in the higher chance being able to then consider at that point whether they want IPD. So in terms of the activity, we expect around 400 um, screen positive or higher chance NIPT results per year. That equates to about eight per week across England. Um, and you can see that we think the PPV is around a little lower than the literature would tell you, um, around about 94%. Um, most literature would say around 98 to 99. We expect to see no results. Um, we the co main cause of low, no result is low fetal fraction, which means you can't extract sufficient cell-free fetal DNA to identify whether there is additional DNA material or not. This is more of a problem in, in, in women with a high maternal BMI, which you know is a, an increasing demographic in the pregnant population. For some reason, more, more prevalent in IVF pregnancies. I think the evidence is really clear about why that is at the moment. And certainly the next three, small fetus or placenta, low PAP A and low HCG, tend to be in fetuses who are affected by 1813. So we expect to see potentially more no results in those pregnancies that are affected. <clears throat> So we've set, and I, it's very difficult to know what the no result is going to be. We've said it could be anything between 2 to 15. So we're working on the basis of around 5%, which some labs will say is high. Others will say is probably about right. But again, that would give us around about 400 no results annually or eight per week across England. Okay. So there's our predictions for what's going to happen. Around about half a million tests about 13,500 to 14,000 screen positives, around 5,000 women taking inv invasive prenatal diagnosis, around 7,500 to 8,000 taking an IPT, and around 400 each per year, positive screens and no results. Um, but of course, they're all predictions, and we will probably have to explain why we got those predictions wrong when the evaluation data comes in. Thank you very much.